This is our research lab at Exeter University, where we're looking into the impacts of microplastics on a number of marine animals, including zooplankton, but also other species like mussels and crabs. Now we've learned from our field work that microplastics do occur in really large numbers in the same parts of the ocean as zooplankton. But what we couldn't tell from these samples was whether the zooplankton are actually eating these microplastic particles. Our samples just got too messed up in our nets to be able to see what was going on. So it's really important that we complement this fieldwork with controlled laboratory experiments where we can look at these questions in much more detail. The type of zooplankton that we're studying in particular are copepods. Now these are really cool little crustaceans, a bit like tiny shrimp. And they're important because they're present in vast numbers in our oceans. They're actually one of the most dominant species on the planet. They're also really important bottom of the food chain food source, which lots of other species like fish and whales rely on for their food. Now, copepods are filter feeders. What that means is they have appendages on their feet, which are like giant combs, which they use to sieve food out of the water. But what we're really interested in is whether this feeding mechanism means they might accidentally be sifting out plastics as well as their food and therefore accidentally eating them. Whenever we're doing science in a laboratory, it's really important that we start with a hypothesis that's based on our existing knowledge of what we're trying to test. In this case, our hypothesis is copepods eat microplastics. Then we design our experiments around this hypothesis to carefully test it. One of the benefits of doing laboratory work as opposed to field work is that we can use controlled conditions to very carefully test the hypothesis that we're looking at and see things in much more detail. We can also use sophisticated pieces of equipment such as high-powered microscopes to give us much more detail of what's going on inside the copepod. When we're running experiments in a laboratory, we can control for all the other factors that might affect the outcome of our experiments. In this case, Environmental variables like temperature or food availability might influence whether the copepods will eat the plastics or not. So we need to control these carefully so that they're the same in all of our experiments. One of the other things that we can do in a lab experiment is use fluorescently dyed plastic particles. This means we can see them much more clearly. So we can actually tell if they're on the outside or the inside of the copepod when we look at them under a fluorescent microscope. This means we can actually see much more clearly if the copepods are eating these plastic particles. When we're designing an experiment, it is important we consider whether the experiment is a fair test. One of the key ways to do this is to make sure our data is reproducible. In other words, would we get the same result if we repeated the experiment? It is important to have a suitable number of replicates to make sure the result we get isn't just a one-off. So in this experiment, I've prepared 10 bottles that each have exactly the same conditions. So the same volume of seawater and exactly the same concentration of fluorescent microplastic beads. We then add the same number of copepods to each beaker. And then next we transfer those bottles to a controlled temperature lab so that we can be sure the temperature of each bottle is the same. After 24 hours, we take the copepods out and preserve them. We can then look at them under a fluorescent microscope to see whether they have microplastics within their guts. Since there was no variation in the response, meaning that all of the copepods ate the plastic, we were able to confidently accept our hypothesis that filter feeding copepods can eat microplastics in lab conditions. We then wanted to see if eating microplastics has any effect on how much normal food, which in this case is algae, the copepods are able to eat. We tested this second hypothesis that eating plastic reduces natural food intake. For this experiment, we compared five control beakers containing just seawater and algal food, but no plastic, with five test beakers with the same amount of seawater and algae but with microplastics added to the mixture. Copepods were added to each beaker, put in a rotating plankton wheel and then left for 24 hours. And then we measured how much food that the copepods had eaten within each bottle. We found that if there were microplastics in the water, the copepods were actually eating a lot less food than in the controls. This is a really important finding as animals need food for energy, which they in turn use for growth, movement and reproduction.
Our lab experiments have now shown very clearly that copepods and other zooplankton will eat microplastics. But we've also done work on other species, like mussels and crabs, that shows they will also eat microplastics in the lab. We've even seen that you can get transfer up the food web. For example, a mussel that's eaten plastics will then pass plastics onto the crab when the crab eats the mussel. But we still have lots of unanswered questions. For example, what is the impact of these microplastics on the animals that's eating them? Does it affect their health at all? We don't know this yet. And also, will the plastic particles pass all the way up the food chain to the seafood that we eat ourselves? We still have lots of research to do to answer these questions.